Hi everyone, I'm Sensei Tony and welcome to the live stream of our meditation service. We're going to be using the Book of Common Meditation to do the Liturgy of the Day C. Before we begin, I'm going to open the space of our altar. Um, and, uh, you can prepare your, your altars as well. I'm going to take a moment here, um, our candle went out, <laughs> I'm going to take a moment here just to briefly describe what I'm doing when I'm opening the space. So you can see, I think you can see the elements on the altar. Uh, we have the sand for our offering. We have our centering image, which is my favorite Buddha Hote, which is also up here. And we have a candle. And that candle represents the, the light of our practice, something that we do every day. And the flowers here represent uh, both water and life. Uh, and they represent the beauty of life, but that it is constantly changing. And so our Buddhist altars will put fresh flowers or plants, but then we allow them to go through their natural cycle death and that reminds us that life is beautiful and yet transient contingent and then the pine sprig we use with water that's been blessed to open the space and that's to mentally mark this as a secure place for us to open our hearts and minds in spiritual exploration so I will now offer the incense And the circle that we make is for what were called the three worlds in ancient tongue. And that means that we, we recognize the present, the past, and the future. All is one. Let's continue by celebrating the liturgy of the day. Let us share the peace. May all beings awaken to that peace which is our true home. Let us take refuge. I take refuge in the ground of being within which I live and move and breathe. Let us make the accord. I take sanctuary in the heart of being, 
accepting all of my delusions in thought, word, or deed, born of ignorance, hatred, and greed. Let us give thanks. I give thanks for all things, awakening to the interbeing of all nature. May my heart be open and my mind clear. May all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And may all come to know that peace which is born of insight and understanding. Since it is the practice of enlightenment, that practice has no beginning. And since it is enlightenment within the practice, that realization has no end. So uh, last week I uh, began uh, our talk about the one of the limbs on the Eightfold Path, or one of the, uh, the ways of practicing uh, the Buddha Dharma. And, and I was talking about right mindfulness. And last week I was distinguishing between mindfulness and meditation. Because I think today there's a lot of confusion over uh, those being the same, being different, and uh, you have a right to be confused because as ubiquitous as the words meditation and mindfulness have become, they've also led people a little bit astray. And because there are different Buddhist traditions, in other words, there are very many different Buddhist schools or denominations, if you will. And each denomination, to some degree, interprets the meaning of these words slightly differently uh, and that's not unusual uh, for religious or spiritual traditions it's very common for people to interpret the meaning ground a little bit and then i'll go into what i call part two tonight <clears throat> And I think I, last week I also uh, clarified our, our dragonfly song approach and interpretation of that word. So essentially, in, in our order, in our dragonfly sangha, we see meditation and mindfulness as being part of an interdependent practice. And yet, even though we see them as essentially one, in an interdependent practice, we do understand them as two different practices. For us, mindfulness is very simply defined, utilizing the words ascribed to the Buddha Shakyamuni in the text known as the Dhammapada. And in the Dhammapada, the very first lines and the first chapter which are sometimes known as the twin verses, the Buddha essentially says that everything arises with our thoughts, is made by our thoughts, and our experience of the world is caused by our thoughts. So it's very clear from that very simple line that mindfulness is the teaching about the way we think and how the way we think causes how we feel. These were passive ways. And those actions in turn create consequences. And what happens is then we get on kind of a big loop, if you will. And if we're suffering, that big loop is known traditionally as samsara wheel of suffering. However, that same wheel, if illuminated by the liberating teachings of the Dharma, that same wheel becomes the wheel of Nirvana. So what's crucial is that we understand and make changes on the wheel. And the most profound change we can 
thoughts, beliefs that cause the rest of the chain of interdependent causation to happen. Now, some of you out there <clears throat> may say, wow, that really sounds like something else I may have read somewhere. So, for example, you may have read amongst uh, Marcus Aurelius, or you may have read among some of the Stoic philosophers, or, you know, you could quote badly here, but it's not uh, that a thing in itself is bad, but as a man thinketh, so it is, and then uh, makes it so. Uh, sorry for messing up the bard's line there. <laughs> And in the Bible, there's a passage, uh, I believe in the Proverbs, that it, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And, and then you can find it in, uh, in modern Western psychological traditions, and they, they have a tendency to talk about it as cognitive behavioral therapy. And so there's, there's other folks that have, you know, come across this idea. I would argue that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, is the first person in our human history who highlighted and pioneered not just the concept, but very specific practices about how we can free our minds from suffering by freeing ourselves from beliefs and thoughts that uh, are not helpful and are not based in reality. And so that's what makes it unique. Even Shakyamuni said that what he was sharing wasn't something that he had made up, but something that was a universal wisdom that all the Buddhas of the ages had taught. And so it's very important to understand not only that when we talk about mindfulness as the way we think and change the way we think, it's very important for us to note that the distinguishment is that while a lot of different people have talked about that or spoke about that after the time of Shakyamuni, um, no one put together a systematic psychotherapy for a systematic process the way that the Buddha did. So, that's the simple definition. about mindfulness as a sort of a meditation practice, a concentration practice, where I become mindful of my, my breathing, or I might become mindful of an object that I'm looking at. Um, I, I can become mindful of my body. Um, some will talk about mindfulness in that sense. Sometimes people just will define mindfulness as being aware of this moment and trying not to live in the past or the future, but kind of right here. I think that's very difficult for humans. I think it's one of the gifts we have that we can time travel. But that being said, uh, we all honor the idea of being present. But that's not how we define mindfulness. We would say that being aware of one's breathing, one's body, or even one's thoughts, meditative process. When we teach meditation, we teach it primarily as a way of learning to observe our physical sensations, our feelings, and our thoughts without identifying with them. And we use the breath or a mantra to help us to stay present when any of those experiences might sort of go off, take us off somewhere, or maybe if they're unpleasant, we try to push them away, or we might become attached to them. We learn to sit in the present moment and breathe and watch and observe. And then the second type of meditation we teach is abiding and that's where we learn to rest in our true nature and allow ourselves to just be. Um, and in that sense, uh, meditation becomes a symbol of our understanding 
that our worth and value as human beings is inherent and cannot be added to or subtracted from by what we do or don't do, what we have or don't have. So that's clear. Sometimes uh, also you will find that meditation and mindfulness get sort of mixed up a little bit together where people will uh, say that um, meditation it's not what you think <laughs> and and by that they're, they're, what they're saying and I, I think you know maybe correctly what they're saying is that meditation isn't necessarily thinking in the Western tradition we have a sense of meditation as thinking about something but honestly, in some Buddhist traditions, it's very similar to that. The word for meditation, for example, that we're used to in, in English is rooted in a word that is sort of like a, a cow chewing its cud. You know, I grew up on farms, so you watch cows chew their cud all the time. And it meant to kind of chew on something and kind of run it over and over in your mind. Well, quite honestly, there are some Buddhist traditions that talk about meditation that way. But in the Dragonfly Sangha, we do it as I just described. Likewise, sometimes people will say mindfulness. Um, it's, it's also not what you think. And what they mean by that is, and usually you'll find this not in the southern traditions of Buddhism, in Asia, but in the northern traditions, where they put a lot of emphasis on what they call intuition. And so it's all it's about getting in touch with that transcendent or that space or that um, center within that transcends all words and all images. In Greek, they, uh, Greek traditions, and in Christianity, they have that too. They call it apophatic. Way. And and while I totally get what they're saying, that when they use the word mindfulness that way, and that it's about getting in touch with this intuitive center, the pro I have some problems with it. So the first one is that whenever someone says that mindfulness is not about thinking, um, and they're referring to this idea of intuition. I really, I guess I really need to know how they define intuition. And then I'll share with you what I define it as. Uh, intuition for a lot of people is some mysterious power that, that folks have. And it, it guides them in ways that their reason and their uh, other things can't do. I got to be honest with you, I don't really buy into that. think that there are instinctive conditionings within the human brain that are related to the you know millions of years of evolution that we share with other creatures on this planet and so we have you know very fast reactions uh, to stimuli most of this coming from the reptilian part of the quadrant brain you know and we talk about it as our uh, fight, flight, or freeze uh, aspect. There's another F in there, but we'll talk about that tonight. But that all comes out of that part of the brain. It's a drive. It's a reaction. And yes, we have that. And we've inherited that. And so, you know, uh, we might sense stimuli in that way. I mean, most of us have had the experience of walking into a room or having someone else walk into our space and even without knowing the person you know we get these little subtle cues that something's not right you know and so we'll say my gut tells me something's wrong here well it's interesting when people say that we know now from modern neuroscience that that the neurotransmitters that we refer to with the limited consciousness of our self-conscious awareness we have those not only in our brain box 
We have them in our gut. And so some, sometimes when we have a sense about something that's uh, sort of kicked off by stimuli, it could be the neurotransmitters here responding, and we experience it here and not here. That's just a hypothesis. But essentially, I think that that form of intuition is just a reaction. Now, along with that, if you have a functioning neocortex, quickly, at lightning speed, you know, like, like nano speed, you will have a thought. And that thought may be conscious or unconscious, which unconscious just means you're not aware of it, right? So what we call intuition is probably a combination of the stimuli instinct and these lightning fast thoughts that are connecting themselves to the stimuli. Now here's the problem. Most people only remember when their intuition was correct. <laughs> they, they, we have humans. We have a sneaky way of being self-deceptive, and that even probably is an evolutionary adaption. But we only tend to recall things that when it worked. You know, you know, like, oh, I had this intuition, and I did this, or didn't do this, and that happened. So the reality is, is that I, I think, and, that, and I base my opinion on the best, you know, knowledge that we have about these things. And so I really don't think intuition is something spooky. I think it's a combination of those elements or aspects. What do we get in touch with that is transcendent? What do we get in touch with that's beyond words and, and maybe beyond thoughts and images? Well, I can't speak of it. The minute I say something, I've, I'm no longer there. So if I want to truly communicate something that is beyond words or images, I can't use words or images. <laughs> So to some degree, talking about it gets a little bit silly. And I believe, yes, that we do get in touch with something universal in terms of consciousness. Universal consciousness is the ground of our very being. But we have these incredibly beautiful systems that have formed over millions of years. And there, we have this incredible ability as human beings that, you know, we have these thoughts, right? And these thoughts and images can be something not only that we have and we're aware of, but these are things that we can share with others through, through words, through writing, through art, through film, through song. And, and so I believe that, and through silence. So I believe that all of these are ways of expressing the transcendent, the deeply imminent, and that silence is no better than song. It's a different way to express it. But I, I find sometimes when I read or hear some teachers talk, they seem to be putting thinking down the way that they tend to talk about the ego is something negative. So we kind of bust out of that mode too, because for us the ego is not something bad. It's not the bane of our existence or something we're trying to transcend or kill or get rid of. It's something to be embraced. That the way to freedom is through affection through learning to love our ego selves, to care for them, to guide them. And that's how we, we mirror that same practice with others. I was with two of my...
Dragonfly, Christopher Queen, and, and Dan Kozor. Um, beautiful men who have devoted their lives to the Dharma. And I was blessed to spend some time with them this morning. And uh, it was just great fellowship. And we were talking about, you know, how do you express the Buddha Dharma to those that are suffering or through those that are going through a very difficult time? And I said, you know, and each of us sort of shared, and then they asked me, you know, how do you do it? And I said, honestly, I start with an intention. And I believe intention is part of mindfulness. That our intention is all we have. You know, once again, popular words are the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Well, that may be, but that's all we've got. <laughs> so the road to heaven is paved with good intentions, too. But it's all we've got. As part of mindfulness is right intention. And I just said, my intention whether I'm teaching now like this, or I'm visiting someone in a hospital, or I'm, you know, in a counseling space with someone, my intention is to try to express my true self. I really try to allow that experience to be an experience of Buddha, it's an experience of a non-judgmental accepting, compassionate embrace. And I believe that that is what allows people to make the first big step of opening up to a more boundless way of being. So, I hope that was helpful. That will conclude for, for the time being a discussion about right mindfulness. And uh, I hope that if you are experiencing um, any kind of suffering or you've been seeking and you haven't quite found what works for you yet, I hope that you'll reach out to us and let us help you in any way that we can. The moment we receive true and trusting, solid and clear like a diamond, infinite light and life embrace and protect us, liberating us completely. Let us recite together the four immeasurable vows. Sentient beings are numberless, I vow to liberate them. Delusions are endless, I vow to end them. The ways of compassion and wisdom are boundless. I vow to embody them. The way is unattainable. I vow to attain it. Let us share the precepts for the community of the Bodhisattva's vow. I allow my true self to manifest in all aspects of life. I take complete responsibility for my own life and all of my actions. I affirm my personal being and acknowledge it as a path to awakening and freedom. I embrace all aspects of my personal being, including my shadow, so that they may be transformed. I affirm an attitude of openness to my true self, even in the midst of suffering. We will now make the incense offering. I admonish you to do the same at your home altar, and then we will chant the Nimbutsu. We're going to do the same type of chant we did um, last week, which is a, a combination of traditional Japanese-style chanting, and also a little bit I picked up uh, in my time spent with my American Indian friends and uh, they have encouraged me to do this. 
So, please make your offering at this time. After that, we will spend some time abiding.
knowing that we never practice alone or only for ourselves, let us recite and offer the merit of our practice, saying together the Bodhisattva's Gata. We dedicate this practice to the welfare of all beings. May it always be so. That concludes tonight's service. Thank you for being with us. Um, well, some of you may wonder why on some evenings do we sit for long periods in silence, or sometimes it's fairly short. And the truth is, is that uh, it really has to do with the flow of the way that the liturgy is going. Sometimes it's also, uh, you know, we're on space I'm in. And the important thing to know about sitting meditation is that it's really not so important how long you do it. You know, it's really more important, <clears throat> excuse me, the heart you bring to it, the spaciousness you bring to it. And it really doesn't matter how long you do it. But the key to benefiting from this grounding practice is the constancy is doing it every day you know so i would encourage you even if you think you can only do three minutes uh, or five minutes or ten minutes try to take time every day to ground yourself in that abiding practice of meditation again our website is essensetony.com you can contact me there. Blessings on everyone. And thank you.